Hey, everyone, I'd like to thank you for coming this evening. I'm Desmond Scooby. I'm the Executive Director of Unity Care Northwest. And again, thanks so much for coming. What we gathers us here today is that this is National Health Center Week. And once every year, we <coughs> gather together and we celebrate the work of the nation's community health centers, which were founded over 50 years ago and today serve over 23 million people across the country. Here in Whatcom County, we're fortunate to have two community health centers. There's CMAR Community Health Center, and I hope we have some representatives from CMAR here this evening. And we also have Unity Care Northwest. Between our two organizations, we serve about 35,000 residents here in Whatcom County, or about one out of every six residents in Whatcom County. Community health centers were established as part of Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty. And they were established to try to remove barriers for underserved people across this country. And that is, I think, the core of our mission. We provide primary medical, dental, behavioral health, and pharmacy services, as well as um, linkages to other kinds of services that the people that we serve need. One of the realities is that while we as healthcare providers think healthcare is a pretty important thing, we also know that the people that we serve, if they are suffering from homelessness and from housing insecurity, food insecurity, domestic violence, that all these other aspects of their lives impact their health. And we cannot improve their health unless we speak to these other issues that impact their daily lives. And that's a big part of what we're going to talk about today. So I'm really pleased to have our speaker here. But before we move into that, I'd like to ask Greg Winter from the Opportunity Council to come up and from the Bellingham Home Fund. I think one of the truisms is that housing is a huge issue in Whatcom County, as it is throughout the Puget Sound region. We know that our vacancy rates are very low that the supply of housing is inadequate, that housing prices are increasing enormously. And one of the ways in which Bellingham has tried to impact that is through our housing levy, which is up for renewal. So on behalf of CMAR and Unity Care Northwest, and also the Community Health Plan of Washington, which is the one nonprofit health plan that participates in Medicaid, and was established by the community health centers across Washington State. We want to present this check to Greg on behalf of the, um, <laughs> the Bellingham Home Fund for $7,000 to promote the success of that measure um, here in Whatcom County. So, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I really, I, I just can't say enough how, you know, how grateful we are um, for this support for the Bellingham Home Fund. How many of you have heard of the Bellingham Home Fund? All right, good. So the Bellingham Home Fund was passed uh, with overwhelming support in 2012 by Bellingham voters um, who shared um, our campaign committee's belief that um, everybody should have the opportunity to live in safe, affordable housing that's really the foundation for good health. And what's so um, gratifying um, to me and my colleagues that over the six years that the Home Fund's been delivering over 700 new units of uh, affordable housing with great um, examples of showcase projects like Eleanor Apartments, Francis Place, 22 North, Via Santa Fe, and others, what's so gratifying is that over that six years, whether we're at incarceration prevention tables, behavioral health tables, healthcare transformation tables, everybody's talking about housing. Now you could, you could paint that in any light that you want, but the good thing about that is, is that the support and the political will to do more about our affordable housing crisis is growing and growing and growing. And I hope you'll join me and um, the neighbors for the Bellingham Home Fund Committee in supporting the renewal of the Bellingham Home Fund. And I'll just mark this on your calendars if you can, August 29th, 5.30 p.m. At Eleanor Apartments, we're going to be having our campaign kickoff. We'd love to have you all there. Um, it's not necessarily a fundraiser, but if you can help us add to this, that would be, that would be helpful. And finally, I'd just like to also acknowledge that um, in addition to CMAR, Unity Care, and Community Health Plan of Washington, 
uh, Peace Health and United Healthcare have also come forward with substantial support for the campaign. So thank you, everybody that's associated with the healthcare system that's supporting housing. Thank you. And I just say, as a healthcare provider, I think one of our challenges going forward into the future is how do we build a stronger web of services that isn't just about healthcare, but that links people to the other kinds of services that they need to live healthy lives. And I think that's a part of the talk that we can have this evening. So I'd really like to introduce Maury Ingram, who many of you know, who is the head of the Whatcom Community Foundation. And I think I was told I have to pass this off to Jennifer. <laughs> Mark. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Happy National Health Center Week, everybody. Uh, I'm sure it's been on your calendar for months. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is the part I get to talk about you before I talk to you. So um, I want to ask you all to help me welcome Beth Toner. Uh, Beth is the Senior Communications Officer with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. She is a registered nurse with clinical experience in long-term care and community health settings and has more than 25 years of experience in marketing and corporate communications. Beth joined the foundation in 2012, and prior to that, served as the director of marketing initiatives at the Hartford, and as a senior web content developer for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She's also served as a multimedia communications specialist for the University of Pennsylvania Health System. And she traveled uh, to visit us today from Pennsylvania, where she enjoys hiking and camping, and she serves as a volunteer nurse at a free clinic in her community. She is an accomplished runner. She's completed 24 marathons and is an avid fan of the true secret to community health, all things Star Trek. <laughs> so with that, uh, welcome Beth, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. We're thank elated you. to have you here. <laughs> I have now been outed as a Star Trek nerd, yes, so there we go. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to get all kinds of LinkedIn contacts as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, RWJF, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, has been working to foster a culture of health across the whole nation uh, for a number of years. And management guru Peter Drucker is famous for saying, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> so I wonder if you could share your definition of a culture of, of health uh, from the Robert Wood Johnson point of view and tell us a bit about the foundation's work in order to advance that effort. Yeah, absolutely, I'd love to. So this was a, a vision we declared in 2014 um, that we would all strive as a nation together to build a culture of health. So, but what I'd like to say is that's something you can drive, a, that's a strategy you can drive a truck through, right? But it is intentionally broad. So let's think back to the word culture. Culture means a lot of things, right? It can mean art, it can mean music, it can mean history and heritage, right? But kind of the heart of that is how we do things, right? It's how we do things in our communities, in our family, and in our nation. So the, kind of the overarching part of that strategy is m ensuring that we're working together in our nation so that health is an essential part, an essential consideration in everything we do. And as you said it, I, I, you know, I was like, oh, well, I can go home now because, right, I, you know, as a healthcare provider, we often, you, you get tunnel vision, right? It's give this person the right medication, get their HA1C to, that's blood sugar for, I, I, I'm unsure of the mix in the audience, so get their blood sugar to a, a, an appropriate level. But what are all the things in the context of that patient's life that impact health? And that is everything. It's where they live, it is their social support. It is the education they've been able to avail, avail themselves or not. Um, it's do they have access to a car? Do they have access to health insurance? If they have a prescription and health insurance, can they get to the pharmacy to pick that prescription up, right? So it's understanding that health needs to be an essential component of everything we do. And it's, it's knowing that health, health is impacted by everything we do. Everybody can play a role in impacting health. So, and as we think about the work that the foundation does, so we're, we're split up into um, what I call grant making themes. So it reflects our conviction that health is affected by everything. We have a team that's focused on healthy communities. So thinking about the context of the community, how can we 
build up the assets that exist within the community to make it a healthier place to live for everyone. Uh, healthy child. So we know that all the things that happen before a child walks through the door of kindergarten has, can have a long-term positive or negative impact on their health. It's not just did they get the immunizations that they need, but do they have the social support at home? Have they experienced trauma? Have they been supported in dealing with the trauma in their lives? Um, leadership. We've been thinking a lot about lead, the kinds of leaders we need to get to a culture of health. And one thing we've come to in the new programs that we launched a couple years ago is that we need leaders who work across sectors, right? We need, yes, we need good nurses, we good, need good physicians, we need good social workers, but we also need to enlist urban planners. We need to enlist civil engineers. We need to enlist anthropologists in the mission of building a culture of health. Um, I want to make sure I'm not leaving it. Health and healthcare systems, right? That seems the most obvious one for the foundation and what's been our bread and butter um, since we were founded in 1972. But it's not just making sure that our healthcare systems are delivering value and that they're providing safe care. That's super important. But also, are they aligned with the needs of the community? Are they, are they serving the community in a way that will make that community healthier? And then we also have teams that are looking at kind of cutting edge and emerging trends. Uh, I actually supported that team for a while with communications. That was a lot of fun. Um, and then we have a team that looks across the globe. While we do our grant making in the United States, we do look across, the, we have a team that spends some time investigating models that are working overseas and finding ways to, can we bring this here? Can it be sustainable here? So. Uh, we actually spent some time uh, talking to uh, a public health nurse who worked with the police department in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, and the police were confronting an epidemic of violence. I hate using that word because it's overused, but really just constant violence. What they found is that when they started bringing public health workers along on police calls, they started being able to address some of the issues. So it's not arrest this guy and put him in prison or in jail. But let's look at how we got to this evening where you picked up the phone and called the police. So what's missing in this household? What ways can we support you to prevent this from happening again, from giving you the economic security and the social supports you need to, to not be a repeat offender? Um, so th th just cool learnings. Um, and then underpinning it all is the theme of health equity, right? So not everybody has access to the same opportunity to be healthy, um, where you're born, how much money you make, the color of your skin, your belief system can affect um, your ability to get and or stay healthy. So that is an important component of everything we do. Great. Um, so Whatcom County, as you know, because you've done deep research on us, um, is, is generally considered a pretty healthy place. And so we rank high on a number of lists in terms of desirability. And yet, when we look at that data in a more granular way, uh, what we find is that there are huge disparities, profound disparities for a lot of our neighbors that are hidden among those averages. And the, the health outcomes that people experience are much, much worse. So we're, we're balancing, the, like most communities, these assets and these challenges all at the same time. And so some of the things we have going for us, clean air, uh, working farmland, open space, trails, recreational opportunities. Um, we have a very strong bicycle culture, um, school districts that are thinking more and more about this idea of a culture of health, even though if they're not necessarily using that kind of terminology, uh, I could go on. And then some of the challenges, though, are things like access to that healthy and local food, access to affordable housing, access to recreation, and just places to go and kind of be in the beautiful nature that surrounds us. So as we, as we think about our comparison to other communities, what does that look like from your point of view? Um. So deep research. Yeah. I would. I. I, I am a. Re, I am also. I'm not just a Star Trek nerd. I'm also a research nerd. I love because I also spend time as a journalist. So I kind of dug into what I saw here. Um, so I'll tell you a couple of things. One is, and Maury, I told you this prior to us getting started, and that's that um, this county looks a lot like the county. So I work in Princeton, New Jersey, which is that is a whole other issue when it comes to inequity. But so I live in a county in, in Pennsylvania that actually consistently ranks at the top of the county health rankings. Um, but in that county, there is a pocket of, of poverty 
that can be easily hidden, or I should say that those of us who live in comfort and privilege can easily ignore. It is not visible um, because it is not an, an urban setting, right? It's a very mixed setting, so we can we cannot see it. Um, so, but as you ask the question, you know, how do you compare? Where do you, are you starting from a place of strength, right? So first of all, I'm just going to be jealous for a moment that you have two community health centers because the county I live in, we don't have any community health centers. Keep in mind we're the healthiest county in Pennsylvania, but that is, um, but lots of folks who have access to healthcare by virtue of their income and their, where they live. Um, we have a patchwork of small community, uh, or, or uh, volunteer run clinics, um, one of them the one I volunteer at. But we don't talk to each other, we don't coordinate care. So I'm jealous, so in that regard, yes. Um, and you mentioned it, um, you live in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, you can't, this is a great place to be active. I mean, aside from the smoke outside today, which kind of stunned me when I got up this morning, um, you know, I, I got two runs in this weekend. The climate is amazing here. You guys can complain all about the rain all you want, but you don't have to shovel it. So, you know, this, <laughs> it's, this, is, this is a great climate in which to be active. And every time I come out here, I'm like, oh, I, yeah, oh, I love it out here. Um, so yes, you have access, and, it, and you do have, I, was, I walked around Seattle with my brother this weekend, and so many bikes and so many people out walking. And I will tell you, there are many communities where that doesn't happen. And I could see it even driving into town today. Um, and here's the other thing, you're asking the question, how do we compare, how do we stack up, what you guys are thinking about this, and that to me starts you from a position of strength. Um, so I looked at the county health rankings because I thought that was a good place to start. How many of you know where you rank in the county health rankings? I'll bet you do, Maury. Show of hands, how many people know where you are or have looked at the county health rankings? There we go. Okay, so you're set. This year you were seventh out of 49. So that's actually really, really good, right? So I'm gonna because this is a room. How many healthcare providers do we have in the room? Raise your hands. Okay. So it's a good place to start looking at the county health rankings because what's cool about and I, yes, I'm stumping for a project that's supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, but <laughs> but it's a good place to start, right? So I started by I went to the website for Whatcom County and you can click on areas of strength. Um, so here's some of the things that are that you got going for you. One is the exercise component that we already talked about. So compared to other top performing counties, um, only 15% of adults 20 and over in Whatcom County report no leisure time activity. So even the most top performing counties, that number is at 20%. So everybody here is pretty active. So that's that's good. Um, yeah, you still have an opioid problem but you're desk for 100,000. No, I don't, and I'm sorry, that didn't mean the sound that, that was, that sounded flippant. I did not mean to, it's, but yes, you have an opioid. You're making funders look bad. <laughs> um, you do have an opioid problem, right? We all have an opioid problem, but you guys are doing much better than a lot of communities. You have fewer deaths per 100,000 than a lot of communities, so that is a place of strength. And other communities could learn from what you all are doing. Um, also, alcohol impaired driving trends. Um, that is a not insignificant problem in the Pacific Northwest, but Whatcom County, Whatcom County is doing better. 19% in your county um, compared to the overall state average, 34%. So you guys are doing really well there. So I have some bad news though. Um, alcohol consumption, not so good. Um, so uh, adults who report excess or um, binge drinking is at 21% compared to other top performing counties at 13%. Uh, premature deaths are doing pretty well, but we talked about this ahead of time. The differences between being white and being black in this county are pretty stark. So this is a more complicated com conversation, a, a complicated calculation but it's years of potential life lost before 75 per 100,000 people. Um, so only an epidemiologist could come up with that. Um, so it's 5,100 in Whatcom overall, but for blacks, that number is 7,500. So that's a huge stark disparity. So that is a downside. Des, you mentioned it already, housing. So, um, 
we define it severe housing problems as one of four things. Per this is the percentage of households with at least one of four housing problems. Overcrowding, high housing costs, or lack of kitchen or plumbing facilities. So 21% of Whatcom residents are experiencing these severe housing problems compared to other top performing counties, they're at 9%. So housing is clearly an issue for you guys. Um, high school graduation rates compared to top performing counties, you're at 80% compared to with more top performing counties or 95%, but the good news is your high school graduation rates are trending up. So I hope that's helpful. And yes, I was not making light of the opioid <laughs> epidemic. There is, there is a question of scale and you are doing much better than a lot of places. Yeah. Great, thank you. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit as we think about this idea of, of the polarities of strengths and, or advantages and disadvantages and how you think about that uh, in your work as you talk both with and about communities. So you're talk, thinking about within the communities mm -hmm. themselves, yeah. right? So as we think about equity overall, um, we know that there are systemic issues um, that keep us and they're cultural, they're, they're built into our educational systems, they're built into our policy making systems. The game to many people may feel rigged. Um, and I'm, I'm using that not lightly. Um, some of us just are born with more advantage than others. And I, as a white middle income woman who was fortunate enough, not because I am a better person, but because I was born in the right zip code, was able to have access to a college education and a safe household growing up and fresh foods, um, something I didn't appreciate <laughs> as a child um, and appreciate a lot more now. Um, but I think also it's understanding that every community has assets. And I think sometimes, and, and we've had these discussions at the foundation, um, so often philanthropy and funders swoop in and say, look, we have money, we have solutions for you. Here you go, we know, we know what's best for you. But the fact of the matter is, the solutions often lie within the community. Even people who do not have all the advantages have a lot of suggestions and ideas about how to overcome those barriers, but it takes a willingness to listen, to, first of all, to ask the question. Then it takes the courage to listen to the answer, and then it also takes the fortitude to act on that, right? Because if you are speaking from a place that is not one of power, I should say, if you are listening to someone who is speaking that is not from a place of power and you have power, it is my feeling that it's your responsibility to allow that person to, to use their agency and elevate that voice and say, let's bring this voice into the conversation. Great, thank you. Could you give us a couple of examples of other communities that have tackled some of the issues and challenges that we face that we might learn from? Yeah, so, um, so I actually came up with a, a long list of communities who've done this. So I'll start with um, a little town down the road that you guys might know, Seattle. Um, just little town. So they just recently rebuilt, and we actually took a tour of this development uh, when some of our folks were out here for Academy, uh, the Academy Health Conference. Um, they rebuilt one of their public housing developments, Yesler Terrace. So instead of just overhauling it, making it look pretty, um, as the planners laid out the redevelopment, they started thinking not just about updating the infrastructure, but trying to inspire, and I'm gonna quote here because I loved this, social, physical, and artistic interaction among not only residents of Yesler Terrace, but a wide range of citizens and visitors to Seattle. So I think that's, so you hear all those things that are in there, right? It's about the interaction between people. It's not us and them. It's not those of us who can afford these super expensive apartments in Seattle and those who live in the public housing development. We are all citizens of the same place, the same planet. How do we interact? How do we learn from one another? So they built that physical environment to encourage interactions. Things like a spacious Central Park for daily use, 
They also make sure they have cultural fairs and farmers markets and things in that open space. The pedestrian pathway runs diagonally through it to encourage people to walk through it. And they included exercise spaces, right? I guess that feels like a no-brainer to the public health folks, but they included exercise spaces. Um, they also provide wellness activities, health education, and home visits, and consequently, ER visits are down in that public housing development. Um, and I think one of the keys to Yesler's success is that they have they incorporated the people living in that development into the redesign, asking them what they needed, asking them what would make them feel at home, right? Rather than feeling stigmatized, rather than feeling alienated. Um, so I'll give you another example. Um, we talked about a little bit about access to fresh foods. So there's a rural county in Kansas called Allen County. So they have, one, they have a very similar issue, um, access to fresh foods. So in one town in Allen County, they brought together not just the government, but community boosters and private businesses to create a mixed use development. So it had a supermarket as an anchor, um, but it also had 12 new apartment units and a medical clinic on site which to me shows how important it is for all the sectors to collaborate, right? It's simple, well, it's not simple. It, it can be difficult to get a supermarket with fresh food, but also think about bringing all those things together, right? So the more all those sectors can collaborate, the better the chances it has of impacting health. Um, and in the same county, there was another small town, 800 citizens, the one supermarket in town, which was fairly small, but it was the supermarket in town. The owners were ready to retire. So citizens of the town and other local businesses partnered up to buy out the retiring owners, which I'm sure the retiring owners were super happy about, um, and created a community food co-op, So, which is a, a, a win for everyone. So we are a mix of urban and rural, uh, like the community that you come from and many others. Um, do you see there being different strategies for urban communities versus rural communities? And could you talk a little bit about that? Yes and no. Um, so I think let's start with the what's different, right? Like when you have a mix of communities. I think the most important thing to recognize when you have a mix of rural and urban, um, which let's face it, in a, this all, a struggle a lot of counties are facing, right? Or mix of rural and urban. Um, it's a, not assuming that everybody wants the same thing, right? So I think often when we live in a, a community where we have access to um, a lot of retail, a lot of education, all those things, we get very kind of self-righteous. Okay, well, let's make sure we have a farmer's market, right? To somebody who lives in a rural area, I don't care about a farmer's market. I can't get to the doctor. I, mean, I, I can't, you know, it's a, and I, so I'm going to give you an, an example from my personal life. Uh, week before last, my husband and my 11-year-old and I went to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So I grew up in the Midwest. I had actually never stopped in the Upper Peninsula. I had only driven through the Upper Peninsula. So I, I thought I knew rural. I've been to visit, like, rural Montana. Um, I was really astonished at how rural the Upper Peninsula of Michigan is. And I mean, I'm displaying my ignorance because I know, I imagine you have rural spaces that are that rural, but I'm talking about an hour without a cross street. Um, so the two staples of Upper Peninsula life are fried whitefish and pasties. Does anybody know what a pasty is? Oh, yes, okay. So it's a, a pastry filled with veggies, yes, and also meat and onions and potatoes. It's really, really good, but it is most, neither of those things are, assur are assuredly not health food. And if it's made traditionally, it's made with a suet crust, so. <laughs> yes, it absolutely is, and boy, it is good that way. And don't forget, they also serve with gravy or ketchup, which that's a discussion for another time. Um, so we were there about five days, and my husband just declared, I need a I need a salad. So we went to the grocery store in Munising, which is on the north side of the Upper Peninsula on Lake Superior. And I will tell you just the, first of all, there was not a big selection of fresh vegetables, but they were so expensive. 
Um, and we were on vacation and we had vacation money to spend, right? So what is it like to live there day to day and make those? But my husband also can't not talk to people. So every place we went, he would say, so did you grow up here? What do you love about being here? What do you not love about being here? And we talked to this um, man who was probably eight, eight or 10 years older than I was. And he and his wife had moved to the Upper Peninsula. And for him, he said, my wife hates it here because she has to drive an hour to Sault Ste. Marie to go to the doctor. So, right, it's not, you have to ask what's important to you, right, and not assume what is important to others. So I think that when you've got that mix, you have to have the rural and the urban voices at the table when you talk about how to plan as a community to improve health in the county. But having said that, uh, we recently funded some work studying kind of the bright spots in Appalachia, which is writ large, is fairly rural. Um, and one thing that was really interesting is that in the places, the rural places where health outcomes were better than expected, there were some things that were pretty consistent in both rural and urban communities where health outcomes are good. Everybody was engaged, right? The community members were engaged in policy you know, policy advocacy. There was a lot of volunteering going on in the community. Um, there were strong social connections, schools, churches. Um, there were barber shops and other agents of change, like local ministers. So they were all engaged in the in the health in what I call the health making process. Um, and they had good anchor institutions, right? Whether you're rural or urban, you need strong businesses, banks, schools, and hospitals. So I think it's a, it really is a mix, right? It's knowing what is unique and important to each part of the community, but also knowing the things that are critical to success, whether you're rural or urban. Great, thank you. So there are multiple and formidable uh, systemic barriers to sustaining a culture of health. Um, racism, sexism, financial interests in maintaining the status quo, um, limited perception of what's possible, whether that be at the policymaking level or on the ground uh, in communities, and, uh, and then the generational patterns of poverty, and we could go on. So what are some of the ways that you've seen other communities work to overcome these? Um, so I'm going to start by telling you a story about Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, so in, how many, do we have any Civil War historians? <laughs> so Vicksburg, 47-day battle was considered by many to be a turning point of the Civil War. Um, let me pull up. I won't have to pull up my notes on this. Uh, nearly 20,000 dead. Um, but it did, it was turned the tide of the Civil War. Many people think it did. Um, so there is now, as there is with many Civil War battlefields, there is a, a memorial park to that, a national military park. Um, so the, it's a, it's a, Huge park, 1,700 acres, 12 miles of walkways, 16 miles of roads that can be biked on. Um, but the park director noticed that not everybody in the community was using these walkways and these bikeways. So uh, he asked the founder of Shape Up Vicksburg, who happened to be an African American, he asked her, Linda, why are people, why do I not see African Americans, why do I not see blacks using the park? And she looked at him. She said, well, I think it's obvious. She said, I feel, we feel that this park commemorates slavery and commemorates the systems that have oppressed us. And he was totally blown away by that. So he stepped back, and they organized during Black History Month a shared walk. Um, and I want to read, read to you some of what he wrote. Um, our shared history, our shared community, and our shared health. So Rangers led a walk um, past the United States Colored Troops Monument, representing African-American soldiers who fought on both sides of the war and the Vicksburg National Cemetery, which includes 7,000 black soldiers. The Rangers told the story of the Battle of Milliken's Bend, just across the Mississippi, where African-American troops engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat to defeat Confederate attackers trying to seize a depot. Um, and it was so, first of all, people were blown away. They didn't know this piece of history existed. It opened up an opportunity for dialogue, and this walk has become an annual event. 
but it started with a question and then it followed with a conversation and then it followed with a commitment to action. Um, so I think that's, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a really good example, but we're, and we talked about this a little bit before we got started, it comes back to narrative, right? So I was, an, I was a writer before I was a nurse. I was a journalist before I was a nurse. But narrative allows us that storytelling, that curiosity brings down the barriers that we throw up and that systems throw up around us, right? Our, our, our living in separate communities throws up around us. It allows us to be curious and get to know other people as human beings, right? Um, if I can be curious about what drives you, if I can know the context of your life, then we are much more likely to be able to work together and find the things that both make us unique and different and that enrich each other's lives as well as the things that we share. And we've been having a lot of conversations in different venues around the topic of equity and, uh, and race and racism uh, in this community. And one of the things that's been interesting in talking to people, and it's certainly been true for me as a white female, uh, is that most of us that are white realize when we get into these conversations that we've just simply never had to think about our race. It's not a way that we've defined ourselves. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the experience that you've had in communities in exploring that and what it looks like. Um. You know, I think we've had a lot of talks about this internally as well. I will tell you that at the foundation, we have had to talk about the fact that we are uncomfortable talking about race. Um, and, and all the other isms, right? But yes, um, I never have to worry when I drive through a community late at night that somebody's going to think view me as suspicious, right? So I think there's a couple of things there. One is... I think we need to become comfortable saying we aren't comfortable talking about race. And I have an African-American coworker and I said, I actually said that out loud. I said, I'm often afraid to talk about race because I'm afraid I'm going to say the wrong thing and do the wrong thing. And she's like, oh my God, that's such a start. She's like, I'm afraid I'm gonna say the wrong thing too, right? So I think it starts with Let's all acknowledge this makes us uncomfortable. We, I think so often we, we go straight to the divide, right? We focus on the divide and not on our shared discomfort. So it's opening up that dialogue. Um, I think it's also taking advantage of teaching moments, right? So those of us who are born with advantages, I call it the next generation doing the next generation one better, right? So with my kids, we talk about those things. Um, you know, if I see an inequity that's based on gender or race or sexual orientation, have a conversation about it. Um, say what, you know, I actually, my, my 11 year old said, have you noticed that a lot of the people who seem to get beaten by police are African American? while we were watching the news. And that's a hard conversation to have, right? Because it's really complex and it's really divided. But instead of saying, you know, immediately going to the, to the lecture, be I was curious with my 11 year old. So tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you're thinking about that. Tell me how we might think about changing that. You know, so I think it's, uh, the, to me, it really is looking at those teaching moments. And then I think the other piece is, it's acknowledging our discomfort. It is um, learning from one another and being curious, but it's also connection, right? Um, finding those moments when you interact with somebody at the grocery store. It's so easy, and I'm guilty, so I, should probably step down off my soapbox, but you know, you're in the checkout line, you're checking email, you're checking text messages, and the cashier is checking you out. You know what? Take a moment, put down the phone, make eye contact with that person. How are you? Now, really, how are you? And be prepared to listen to the answer, right? And understand just a little bit of the context of that person's life. And I know that sounds I'm aware of how Pollyanna it sounds, but what if we all made two of those connections a day, right? Instead of flying into a rage or getting frustrated because the person ahead of us is going a little too slowly, instead made that human connection. I think that's, 
And when it comes to the isms, we're also playing a long game, right? This, we aren't gonna win this, we aren't gonna win the battle against sexism and racism and all the isms overnight. And it's not one battle. It is those, it is curiosity. It is teaching moments. It is kindness. It is empathy. It is connection. And the more we commit to it and the more intentional we are about it, and the longer we do it, I think the better the chance we have of overcoming them. And it's remembering that none of us is just one thing. That's exactly yeah. right. I am not, I am not just a, a nurse. I am a mom. I am a writer. I'm a person who gets anxious when I have to go on long drives when I don't know where I'm going. And understanding those things about people. And it goes back to, it does go back to curiosity, I think. So you talked a little bit about the importance of working across sectors. And we as a community are really working and you've already, we've already touched on the fact that we've got some exciting things happening around the affordable housing front. Uh, we are fortunate in having two uh, community health centers. Uh, we've got a, a wealth of resources here in many, many ways. And could you talk a little bit about the role that you see for policymakers and business and education? Because those are often, I think, maybe education to a lesser degree, but those are often areas that we don't pay enough attention. Yeah, and I think it's hard, I think it's hard, difficult in many communities. So I'll start with policymakers. Um, I think you just have to look at Flint as a case where policymakers and it's, it's an incredibly stark example, um, and there are countless other examples that happen all, all across the United States, but where a policymaker's decision, based truly on a dollar figure, had such an enormous impact on the health of a community. Um, I just finished reading uh, Dr. Mona Hanna Adish's book, and I have to, What the Eyes Don't See. So if you are at all invested in public health, you need to read this. It's, she was the pediatrician who was the whistleblower in Flint. Um, and they, the community had to come together to raise the, sound the alarm. Um, but what if, I always like to ask what if, what if instead of making that decision based solely on dollars, what if the policymakers had asked, okay, so who's not at the table as we're making this decision? Do we have an epidemiologist in the room? Do we have a civil engineer? Um, do we have an architect? Who are the people who would understand the systems that we are about to impact? Um, and how should we think about this decision? Um, so, and I think that is a key to policymakers doing a better job with health is asking who's not at the table, right? When we're making these decisions. And also, as we think about being health healthcare providers, as we think about being community organizers and other civically minded people, community members, it's also important to know how your policymakers in your community process information and take it in. When we talk about playing the long game, it's starting to learn the way pro policymakers make decisions and get ahead of that, that snowball before it turns into an avalanche. I was at a conference in the spring at some point, and there was a, I was moderating a panel, and there was a policymaker on the panel who had been a researcher. She told us she schedules meetings in five-minute increments. So if you want to impact a policymaker's decision around something that will impact health, which, by the way, is just about everything, you better be prepared to give your speech and do it quickly, right, and have your facts straight. So that's policymakers. So businesses, um, we think about businesses in three ways at the foundation. One is how they impact the health and safety of their employees. So that's pretty obvious, right? So it's things around paid leave. It's the safety of the work environment. But also, what do the companies understand what their employees are going home to? How are those, how are they interacting with their environment and how does it impact their health? Um, one is the health of the products and services they produce. Um, and then finally, what is their impact on the community? So thinking about Flint, GM, I don't know how many people know this, shortly after the switch from the Detroit River to the, or to the Detroit water to the Flint River, GM noticed that its parts using the Flint River water were corroding. 
So they switched back over to the Detroit water, but never sounded the alarm for the community. So think about, the, and I go back to the what if. What if that decision had been different? Um, how many Flint children would have been saved the lifetime impact of elevated blood levels? Um, and educators, so I'll give you an, uh, an example from my own life. Um, my 25-year-old son um, started last year teaching uh, special, he provides special education support to children in what is called the most dangerous zip code in Philadelphia. Um, and he, my son went into this field uh, because he has had his own mental health struggles. He struggles with anxiety and bipolar disorder and he wanted a chance to impact kids' lives. Um, and it is, he has a front row seat to the trauma that those children experience from day to day. He sees the impact it has on their lives and their ability to learn and their ability to be resilient. And he said something to me that I think was incredibly sobering and that's, he said, mom, it's triage. I have to pick the kids I know are more likely to survive and to help them overcome it. There are some kids I don't know if I can reach. And that to me was, said a couple of things. One is, first of all, we need to equip and support our educators, right? We need to give, I think sometimes we, we lose, uh, teachers only work nine months out of the year. How hard can it be? Um, and yet I would challenge any parent, including myself, to spend that much time with my children <laughs> and say, saying, um, so, you know, so we need to equip and support our educators, but we also need to um, recognize the fact that they are on, they are on the front lines and they're able to sound the alarm. And we need to, and I'm gonna reflect, I mean, this, it's an equity issue. Everybody needs to have access to the same level of education um, and the same quality of education. And until that system is fixed in the United States, um, I mean, we know that you think about early childhood and the impact that adverse childhood experiences have on a child's physiological system, right? Their health as well as their ability to learn and then how it impacts their education down the line. And we know that adults who have only a high school education at age 25 have at least a nine year lower life expectancy. And that should be unacceptable to all of us. So I think I hit them all. Yes, you did. <laughs> Uh, and you touched on uh, this notion of preparing and equipping uh, teachers in particular. And have you seen communities do the same when it comes to elected officials and other policymakers? Oh boy, that's a really good question. I think there are communities where the policymakers have learned to start asking the questions. Um, I think. I think we are seeing more people being engaged in either becoming policymakers themselves, right? I think that you've seen the groundswell of women becoming um, engaged in the policymaking movement. Um, I, I think we're still real early with helping people under helping policymakers understand. I've seen so in Spokane, um, policymakers partnered up with educators and with businesses to really think about, okay, so given the needs of the job market, what skills do we need, right? So they, they, they surveyed the businesses and then they worked with the educators and said, okay, so what are students really interested in? And they created a curriculum that is designed to produce students who can enter the job market there, right? But it took policymakers collaborating with the educators, collaborating with the businesses. Um, but I think we all, we all have a civic responsibility to start getting more engaged. So uh, politics leads to discussion around the polarized environment that we live in. And so uh, that's no different here than it is uh, probably any place else in the country. Um, so how can we as, as community members, uh, some of whom have a professional affiliation with community health and whatever shape or form that might take, but also just some folks who live in the community and want to do what they can, um, how would you suggest that people think about promoting a culture of health in everyday life? Um, so uh, we talk, we've talked a little bit about it today. So I think the key is connection. Um, I love social media and I hate social media. Um, we are so wired and we are so, 
think about the details you know about people's lives that 20 years ago you didn't know. Like you really didn't know what your neighbor ate for dinner and you really didn't care unless they came and, you know, you were out walking your dog and they told you, which would have been weird. So, you know, we've, we've stopped. It, it, no, but it's, it's truly interesting the things that we post to social media that well, we would have been at, at a minimum, just would not have shared because it didn't feel right sharing it. At, at a maximum, we would have been embarrassed. And yet we are connecting with one another. We aren't connecting with each other on a human level. Um, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask, has it ever happened to you that there's somebody that you are, that is friends with you on Facebook that you see in the grocery store that doesn't recognize you? I have had similar experiences. So I'm part of a, a number of, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embarrass myself. So I'm part of a number of hiking Facebook groups, right? And one of them, we did this, this big trail race in upstate PA called the Heiner View Challenge. Um, so the cool thing about this race, it's really tough. Um, and when you finish, you get a hat. So it's become this trendy thing on this particular Facebook page. You wear your Heiner hat, you take a picture wherever you are, Heiner hat goes to whatever. And yes, I did one this week, so there you go, right? But so I was out on the trails, on the Appalachian Trail, uh, doing a training hike, and two young women passed me, and they knew who I was, and I didn't know who they were. And I was really embarrassed. I thought, now, what if instead of a race, I'd taken the time to get to know them? Now, I do know them now, right? So now we're all connected, and when I see them at races. But yeah, I mean, I think social media, and social media can be a great organizing tool. So I don't want to say that it is all bad, but I worry sometimes that it has become a surrogate for real connection. Um, so I think also we need, I think it's absolutely essential as community folks to think about when raising your voice, when it's time to design a new public space. I mean, this space is a fantastic place for the community to get together in. Is it accessible to everybody? Does everybody know it's here? Is everybody welcome here? And I mean, not just mean, are they welcome on face value? Will they feel welcome? Have you asked them, would they feel welcome in this place? Um, we've been, the, the foundation's been thinking a lot about inclusive placemaking. So how do we build places and spaces for people to connect? So think about the playgrounds. Is it accessible to everyone of all abilities? Is it accessible to young people who have difficulty processing things since sensory information, right? Um, but it's important to have the conversation, right? And to build trust within the community and have those conversations early. Um, and then the other thing is just being open to change, right? Dynamics change over time when you think about the places and spaces that people connect. So be willing to rethink it. If something doesn't work, that's okay. How do we fix that? Listen to the voices in the community to say, hey, this, is, this isn't working for me. And at the micro level, the individual level, what do you do to build your own empathy and compassion muscles? Because I'm, I do some of this work and I'm constantly trying to figure out how I check myself because I too have those reactions, those, I make those assumptions about people that I might see and figuring out ways to create triggers or pause points, what do you do? What do I do? All right, so I, here's one thing, and I was, I talked to my community health clinical students about this. One is change your perspective, right? So if you normally drive through your community or get out of your vehicle and walk, right? Um, or sit down and look around. What do you see when you sit down? What, it, what happened? And it seems really simplistic, but change your perspective. Change how you process something. Um, so I start there. One is um, I'm really guilty of reacting. You know, when somebody's in front of me in the supermarket line, oh, it's taking so long. I just want to go home. You know, so I, I mean, I actually have made a, 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 resol I made a resolution this year to try to a, take a deep breath, right? 
Okay, first of all, let's talk about the scale of this problem. It is really not a big deal. But you know, I think we do, we get, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe you all are better at this than I am, but I'm terrible. I, you know, I, I get so busy, I want to check things. I think part of that comes with being a healthcare provider. You get to the, the task mentality, I'm going to check this off. I did this, I did this, I did this. Um, take a deep breath. How important is this really? And then curiosity. Why is this person moving slowly? What kind of day did they have? I don't know what that person, what, what happened when they got out of bed this morning? Did someone, maybe they lost someone in their life today. Maybe they are worried about making ends meet. Maybe they, they're distracted by you know, their own stresses at work or Maybe they feel intimidated. Maybe they're like, oh my God, why is this woman breathing down my neck? <laughs> you know? So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's having that curiosity. It's taking the deep breath. And for me, I think too, it's the, if I, and I think this is something we can all do. There is joy in connecting to other people. When you really, um, when you really make a connection to people and learn their story, um, I've, uh, Uber. I've tried to make a habit of when I get an Uber, you know, my inclination is to pull out my phone and check my work email. But I ask, how long have you been doing this? Who was the rudest customer you ever had? Who was the nicest customer you ever have? You know, I've learned stuff. There's a guy in my mom's hometown of Daytona Beach. He's a retiree. He moved down to Daytona 15 years ago, but he loves working the Uber shift from 4 a.m. to noon because he gets up early anyway, the tips are better, people are nicer, and then at noon he can go to the beach, right? But like I wouldn't have known that, and we had such a good time in that 10-minute window, but there is joy, there is joy, and I don't know if there was joy for him, but there was joy for me, and learning to be curious about other people's lives, right? That keeps me from dismissing them as an other, which I think we have gotten terrible about here is we are othering people. We are not them. They are not us. And the fact of the matter is we're all in it together. And that sounds trite and way optimistic, but I think it's really true. So we've built some momentum as a community, and you talked about the importance of the long game. So how do we keep everybody moving in the same direction, bring more people on board, and continue the work? I mean, I think one thing is network with other communities. I mean... And I'm, you know, obviously I'm going to stump for the foundation, but spend some time looking at county health rankings. There is, we have culture of health prize communities. So we award prizes to a certain amount of communities every year that have focused on collaborating across sectors to improve the health of their communities. But you've got a couple in the Pacific Northwest. Sit down with those communities, say what's working, what's not working. Um, network with the next county over for goodness sake. That works too, right? Um, I think the other thing is, there are many other things, but developing leaders and investing in leadership development. So we talked a lot about, we've talked a lot about civic engagement and the citizens taking it up. But if you see, particularly young folks, right, who are starting to engage or curious, look at what happened after Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Um, that gave me, you know, we get so cynical, but it gave me so much hope regardless of where you stand on the issues there, the fact that young people were able to mobilize in a way that older people hadn't been able to do. So how do we develop folks who are showing signs of engagement? How do we give them the tools to become their own best advocates, right? Because everybody has that agency. We just need to give them the tools to use that agency. Um, and I think it's teaching people like that. I've mentioned our leadership programs. That for me has been just a real eye-opener watching people come together from, we have some two programs that work, they have to come in as teams. Um, and we have a, a program that pairs, they are teams of three, pairs two researchers with a community organizer. And watching researchers and community organizers come together is really exciting. Um, so I think investing in leaders and making sure that people are really collaborating um, and providing the spaces for that, for folks to collaborate. So I think that starts with, and I said it earlier, who's not at the table? When we sit down to make a decision, who's not at the table? Which sectors, who, who is this going to impact? And the answer often is everyone. Who is not at the table? And are we 
are we talking in a space that's going to allow others to feel safe in speaking up? And what tables are we not at that other people are holding? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what is the power dynamic there, right? So how do, we, how do we equalize that power dynamic? How do we become humble in a way that allows us to hear other people um, and share that power? And it's hard. It really is hard. Um, I think it's looking to the groups that, you know, that organize sectors in your community, your churches, the why, um, faith organizations, the Chamber of Commerce, all those organizations, everybody holds a piece of that puzzle. Um, and, you know, faith communities, you talk to a leader of a faith community, whatever faith it is, they see things, they hear things that you may not hear in other forums. And I think they can be hugely helpful. Um, uh, one of the Culture of Health Prize communities, Columbia Gorge, they actually created a Citizens Advisory Council that's made up half of Medicaid consumers, right? But they also are committed to acting when they are given input from everyone at the table, they're committed to acting and that takes courage uh, because sometimes things come up that those in power <laughs> don't necessarily wanna hear or don't necessarily wanna act on. Um, and then this is the, I, I have a, a coworker who says that as we think about developing leaders who can keep us all moving forward, they have three traits. One is they care very deeply. They care about others, individuals as human beings, but they also care about justice and equity um, and about making a difference for everyone, not just for those who already have the agency and the power, but for everyone. They're committed. Um, they're committed to building a future that's different from the present, and they understand that what got us to where we are now, which is, to your point, deeply polarized, we're still struggling with isms. So what we've done in the past hasn't worked. So we're committed to thinking about this differently. So how are we going to get to a better future? And the final thing is they collaborate, right? So we collaborate with others regardless of their walk of life, the labels we've put on them. Um, where they were born. And what do you think success looks like? So, I'm going to, so I'm gonna give you, I'll give you the foundation party line first and then I'm gonna give you a more concrete example of what I think success looks like. So, when we talk about, so I mentioned earlier, a culture of health is something you can drive a truck through. But there are four, when we talk about culture of health, there are, we have an action framework so that we know when we get to a culture of health, when we are doing four things. One is that we're making health a shared value. Everybody declares that an equal opportunity to live the healthiest life possible, it should be available to all, not just a few, right? That we're all making decisions based on how it will impact the health of our communities, and we have a long way to go. Fostering cross-sector collaboration, I've already talked about that. Um, creating healthier, more equitable communities and strengthening the integration of health, health services and systems. So I've said that, and I think we've talked a lot about all those things tonight, I think. Um, but to me, I think individual success, we'll know we've reached success when everybody is, has equal opportunity to access the kind of well-being they desire for themselves. So for me, that is a safe place to hike and run and not be worrying about, am I gonna get hit by a car? Is it safe to, is it safe to run here? Um, for my 85 year old mother, it's can I still get around by myself? And do I have social connections with people who are important to me? Um, and then I'm gonna tell you a story about a young woman in the clinic where I volunteer. So she came in, it's probably been four or five years and I'm gonna call her Jane. Uh, she came into her clinic, she needed uh, thyroid medication. She had an underactive thyroid. She was also type one diabetic. Uh, and we said, look, well, we can't give you thyroid medication. We have no lab work for you. you need to, we need to measure where your thyroid is at now before we can prescribe. So she said, okay. And then she started, we started talking a little bit more and, and the story kind of unfolded. Not only did she have an underactive thyroid and type one diabetes, she was living with her mom she had a three-year-old son in protective custody. She had, a, or in foster care, she had a uh, restraining order against an abusive boyfriend. 
Uh, she was unemployed, and then it was the kicker was she told us she thought she might be pregnant. And I said, well, how pregnant do you think you are? And she said, five months. So we did a pregnancy test, and she was pregnant. So we said, look, here's a slip. Go get your, th your thyroid, get your blood work done. And also, here's a referral for free, and I'm emphasizing free, free prenatal care. You don't need insurance. You need nothing. You don't have to provide documentation of citizenship, none of that. Um, she said, okay. She came back the next week, um, gave her, her she had her blood work done. We gave her thyroid medication. I said, so how did your prenatal appointment go? And she hadn't made her appointment. So I took a deep breath and I said, look, I said, I understand the system can be overwhelming and I, I know that you have other things that you are concerned about, but this is not important, not just for your baby's health but it's also important for your life. You have type one diabetes. This could endanger your life as well. And I said, please tell me that you'll make an appointment this week. And she said, I will. So I said, look, I'll be back in the clinic. This was a Saturday. I said, I'll be back in the clinic on Wednesday. I'm going to call you and find out how your appointment went and just see how you're doing. She said, okay. So Wednesday I came back to the clinic and I called all three of the numbers she had left for us and all of them were disconnected. And we never saw her again. So. I sat down in our medication room and I cried because I was frustrated. I was frustrated at her. I was frustrated at myself for not having been able to help her. But as I think about a culture of health, right, it's taking a step back from that. In a culture of health, we wouldn't have been able to just give her her thyroid medication and make sure she got to her prenatal appointment and had, you know, managed her type 1 diabetes, which are all really, really important, essential things but we would have been able to give her access to put, help put the systems in place to allow her to get an education, to get her job training, to get her, um, get her a car, public transportation, ways to get around, and also to tap into her own innate strengths and resilience. So what I didn't tell you is she was, but we started talking about her type one diabetes. She'd been managing this since she was seven. She kicked but at sliding scale. She was so good at figuring out exactly how much insulin she didn't have a pump. She was so good at it. And so it's clearly a lot of agency and a lot of resilience. She had stood up to this abusive boyfriend and walked out. How do we, instead of looking at her with pity, instead help her take advantage of all that resilience I know she had, right? And not passing judgment on her, but instead thinking with her with compassion and working with her alongside her rather than you know, looking down on our benevolence and saying, oh, we can help you. To me, that's a culture of health, that she has all the systems and supports she needs to tap into her own innate strengths and advantages, despite the things that were stacked against her at the outset. Thank you. It's a good heavy gravity element to transition us to uh, a little audience participation. So we have a little time. <laughs> Haishka Siam Siam Nastelicha Siam Kwanstanat Sanasnat. Thank you, friends and family. I'm Candace Wilson. I'm from Lummi Nation. And I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement of the traditional territory of the Lactamish people, the Wuk Lummi, and the, um, the land of my ancestors, my maternal parents of the Swaloose family. This very area that we are in is the homestead of my ancestors. So, um, and happy National Health, Health Center Week. Mm -hmm. And a special thank you to Unity Care. I always say Unity Care because we care. I really appreciate your leadership in Whatcom County that I have been able to witness. So thank you. And um, most recently, the, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation had come out with a statement about um, Native American mascots and images. And there's an article in Indians.com about reclaiming Native truth, why we cannot support racist mascots and images. So this was an exceptional example of an agency taking the responsibility to stand up and speak about a very um, 
unspoken truth in our history. And I really appreciate the leadership um, that they have taken and taken that position across the nation. Uh, the next task I see coming forward is dispelling truths. There are some truths about um, tribes and, and Native American communities that we may have casinos, that we may not need um, health care services, or that we have IHS, Indian Health Service, available to us. But the truth of the matter is that we are, IHS is underfunded, uh, even in comparison to the Veterans Administration for Veterans for Healthcare, and underfunded compared to prisons. So um, those truths need to be spoken about in our communities because uh, I work with healthcare professionals, and I was recently at a conference that. Um, one of the bigger um, hospital facilities had conveyed, oh, well, the tribes don't need that because they have IHS. And the, um, the fact that we're in this day and age where all these um, true colors are unveiled, we have a responsibility now more than ever to speak up and to carry on the work that not only my ancestors have um, shared to continue to fight the fight and acknowledge um, differences, but to celebrate diversity and equity. So cultural humility is very important in the work that we do. And I really look forward to being a part and to continue to witness what Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is going to be doing. So. Yeah, I really don't have anything other than that statement. So there's no real questions, but I do want to commend you on that leadership. And like I said, I look forward to seeing it. Um, to, it needs to move forward now. You made the statement, it needs to move forward. We have to dispel these truths. So Haishka, thank you. Thank you, Candice. And, um So I want to share with you a transformative moment I had, and I, it goes back to the reclaiming the narrative and the cultural humility, right? And I think that as white people, um, so often we come into relationships where it, it is hard to have a relationship between a giver, a foundation, right, and a recipient without totally skewing the power dynamics, right? And um, so uh, about two years ago, I was invited to participate in a site visit um, to uh, Fort Peck Reservation in Montana. Um, and it was part of a, we had produced a documentary series um, that was it showed in a number of cultures, but within Indian culture, how reclaiming tradition was contributing to increasing the well-being and the health of the community, right? Helping young people find their way. Um, so I went, so we, we got a chance, opportunity to tour and to see the very, the lack of resources that Indian Health Service face. But also I think I came away from that experience. First of all, um, as I think, you asked about what we can do. I think for me, I was so embarrassed and ashamed at how little I knew of the, first of all, of any Native American culture, right? I thought I did, but I didn't. Um, and also how diverse and wonderful it is and how loving and gracious that reservation was in welcoming us when, in my mind, that was, I, 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 so I was, I'm articulating this terribly, but I think, so for me, it was a transformative moment. One is I, as, as a white person, have so much to learn and so, so much more that I need to learn and so much more that I need to appreciate. One is understanding the struggles, but also appreciating all the assets the communities have already, right? Rather than us coming in and offering a solution, 
how can we support you in the solutions you've already created? So, so thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. This is great. I also want to make sure everybody has the opportunity. I've got a couple recommendations for the, uh, the um, Coast Salish um, people. And that one is uh, an exhibit called um, Canoe Journey. And every year, the um, Coast Salish tribes up and down the coast travel from um, their, destin uh, their reservation to the dest host destination that um, will host it. This, mm -hmm. this year, it was Piala. So our relatives from Vancouver Island had traveled down North Vancouver Island by canoe journey all the way down. And it took maybe three weeks for them, where Lummi, it took maybe two weeks to get to Puyallup. But that is an expression of you know, the um, culture of health for us. Right. So right. that's one exhibit that you, um, I really ask and invite you to educate yourself on that. And then locally here, I'm a member of the Children of the Setting Sun Productions. What we do is we go out and we share our story about our teachings and our way of life. So I invite you to look at both of those and I look forward to communicating, collaborating, and coordinating with you. So Haishka, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Mark Pearson, a uh, longtime uh, resident of this community. Know some of your colleagues. Um, this community is starting to look seriously at trying to do something about a culture of incarceration. And I'm just wondering with your travels and your experiences around the country, if you have any uh, uh, optimistic ideas or experiences where uh, punishment can be recast uh, so it's looking at health. Yeah, and we have to, we've had a lot of conversations about this at the foundation. So I will tell you what I've seen um, that I think is hopeful. Um, one is the restorative justice movement. Um, I think the, so restorative justice for, um, and I'm gonna do a terrible job of defining it, but it is the idea that it is a spirit of reconciliation between offender and victim. Um, it doesn't exonerate the offender for the crime, but allows there to be a human connection where it's safe and where it's possible between the victim and the offender. Um, so I think that's hopeful. Um, Mark, are you familiar with the work of Brian Stevenson? So this is a great book to read. Brian, Brian Stevenson came and spoke um, at the foundation about oh, probably a, year, a little over a year ago. He wrote a book called Just Mercy. So he, has, he is a, a lawyer who works particularly with young men of color who are over-incarcerated, right? So white person, African-American person, commit, pers any person of color commit a, commits a crime. Uh, African-American is far more likely to spend uh, jail time. So he is working to, to both raise awareness of that culture of incarceration and also to combat it. Um, I think we have a long way to go. And, um, you know, I think, and this goes back to, to some of Candace's points and to, to your point as well, Mark, I think it goes back to storytelling. One thing I've become increasingly aware of is we don't tell these stories that make us uncomfortable. Um, we bury the narrative. We do what journalists call burying the lead, right? We don't talk about over-incarceration. We don't talk about being on indigenous land. Those are the things that we, so when we think about the things that we as citizens can do, those are things we can do. We can say, have we made an acknowledgement that we are on indigenous land? Have we, do we understand um, what our culture of over-incarceration is doing? Have we shared this? Policymakers, I think, do not understand that. So every one of us has an opportunity, particularly those of us who start from a position of advantage, to use our voice to call attention to that. Um, but that, that's, a, I mean, I'm not going to lie, that's a tough nut to crack, and I think we are, yeah, I think we are still very early in that game. Anybody 
who's here as well. Um, I'm Beverly Porter, and I'm a parent of an adult son who's autistic and transgender. And I recognize in the work that we do how many ways that we do other and make decisions, whether it's incarceration or even earlier in children's school experience, that the segregation rate within schools of special education um, has, has increased rather than inclusion has, has decreased, or the other way. Um, so I want to thank everybody for being here and for being part of that culture of health in Whatcom County and keep working on not othering. Um, anybody who's marginalized for, what, for all of those reasons, the intersection of all of those reasons, and continue to look to Reverwood Johnson and Whatcom Community Foundation and the, and the health centers for um, the guidance that they give all of us. So I want to, um, there's that piece of listening to yourself as an expert and as a source and a resource, and there are amazing things that happen here in Whatcom County, and not just because we don't have to shovel the rain. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Thanks, Beverly. Yeah. Hi, I just have a comment and a question. Um, my name is Sherry Lambert. I'm an X-ray, retired X-ray tech. And when my kids were little, I took a parenting class because my little one would not eat vegetables. <laughs> and it solved the problem. Give them a choice. They're at that age. They need a choice. So we never had a problem again. But those kind of parenting classes are so important because that's the time I think people, women, well, parents need to are interested in learning how to improve their child's life. And it seems like a good opportunity from birth until five to really push good parenting skills. And uh, I know it helped me a lot. So I'm wondering if the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is doing anything on that line. Yeah, no, and I didn't just spend a lot of time talking about it, but our Healthy Child team has actually thought a lot about that because we know that birth to five is the time when that happens. Um, we have, we've actually worked with Sesame Street so there's a website called Sesame Street and Communities, and there's a section for, um, for parents and providers um, that gives parents tips on things like, so you think about choices, right? Uh, I mentioned my 25-year-old son. What I didn't mention is that he was also, has since been diagnosed with OCD, with anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, and he's bipolar, right? He was an incredibly difficult child, and I had no idea what was going on, right? I gave him choices that didn't help. Right, and he just, in, out, I mean, I love my son to death, but I, he absolutely infuriated me. He could throw a temper tantrum that lasted for four hours. So what I wanted in that moment was help managing that, right? And so some of what we're focusing on is helping people who have, so you think about dealing with those stresses in addition to worrying about, am I going to lose my job? Or, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly underpaid. I don't have health insurance. I can't even, you know, this salad I put on the table is going to eat up our budget for three or four days. So how do we give parents the tools to manage those stressors and manage the things that come with childhood? So that's some of the things we've been working on is can we help equip parents with the skills that they need in ways that are easy to access, like a website, right? But then it's also looking at the policies that impact early childhood, right? Do you have access to the kinds of resources you need to provide your child with a healthy meal? Do you know how to prepare a healthy meal that's quick, right? If you're stressed for time, can you come up with something that's, that tastes good, that looks appealing to the child, and you can get into them? So yeah, we are thinking about it. There's, it's, a, it's complex, right? But yeah, absolutely. Beth, anything else you want to share with us in closing? Thank you. I, feel, I sometimes feel like words are inadequate. Thank you for everything you all are doing in your community. The fact that you're thinking about a culture of health makes me super excited. I hope that I've conveyed my passion for this. I feel like every day I, this is, I'm really fortunate to have the job that I have and get a chance to do what I do. And it's not because I'm anybody special, but I happen to luck into this job, and I'm so grateful every day to get to meet people who are doing the work, so thank you. I'd like to ask us all to thank Beth Toner and Maury Ingram for this evening's event, so thank you very much.